if you want to build a rock star organization, you're going to have to fill it with rock stars. So to be honest, I'm not sure where I fall on the spectrum of agreeing with that. And that's why I'm thrilled to introduce you to our guest today, Jeff Hyman. He's the four-time CEO and author of the book, Recruit Rock Stars. Jeff doesn't believe in hiring B players. In fact, he says that hiring B players are actually, is actually more damaging to your company than you'd imagine. Well, I can't wait to hear more about that, as I'm sure you can't either. Let's dig in. Let's welcome our guest today, Jeff Hyman. Welcome, Jeff. Ivana. How are you, Ivana? I am doing great. I'm so excited to have you. As you and I were chatting, we don't do a lot of team topics very often, but it is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. So, it is uh, cliche, it's overused, it's, and it's broken. It's broken, but I think one of the things that you and I were chatting about this in the green room that I am so excited about is that you are not afraid to put it out there. So, one of the things that you say is that 90% of business problems are actually recruiting problems in disguise. Why right. do you say that? Yeah. So, if you think about your business, and I don't care what your business is, if you're running a small website development firm or you're running a car dealership or you're running Google and you, you think about the problems that you face. Often they're sales problems, right? Filling your sales funnel, you're missing your number, uh, your investors are frustrated, your product is shipping late, you have QA problems, almost, almost any problem you think about and if you're honest about it, which is the hard part, and we can talk about that, and you really trace back to what is the core problem. It's usually, I hired the wrong person, I delegated it to the wrong person, didn't hold them accountable, they had the wrong competencies or the wrong DNA to do that task, to fulfill that role. And uh, I just, I rarely find a problem where I can't trace it back to a people problem. And usually that is recruiting. Hmm. So talk a little bit about your background. It says four-time CEO, uh, you have a recruiting business. Talk a little bit about why you can say the things you say. Well, I can say it because it's from gray hair and a lack of, uh, a lack of hair. I've made every mistake in the book, right? There are no magic answers when it comes to people. Um, but I've made a science of it and I've studied it intently for probably 25, 30 years. I'm just kind of fascinated by this topic of talent, of recruiting, of people, because a company is nothing more than people these days, right? It's not about proprietary technology or a brand. It's a bunch of people. It doesn't matter whether it's two or 2000. And so I, my first business, I was 13, right? Got my first uh, Radio Shack computer for my bar mitzvah and started a little company, but my first real company was after um, after uh, graduating from business school. I started a small recruit, uh, an online job board, a small recruiting company. And even though I was in recruiting, I still made every mistake in the book because I had never learned how to do it the right way, right? How to make hires based on things that are predictive. I made every mistake in the book. And so as I started to learn, I kind of became more of a student of it. I started writing down, literally keeping track every mistake I made. What did I do wrong? What would I do better next time when it came to recruiting and, and the people part of my business? And uh, just, you know, along the way, started four companies, three of them in recruiting, one in, in healthcare. And um, now I run a, you know, an executive search firm based in Chicago. And we do this for a living by day, by night. I teach recruiting at at uh, the MBA school at Kellogg at Northwestern. I uh, wrote a book on it, as you mentioned. So it's just, it's my life. It's my passion. It's what I love doing, which is helping entrepreneurs and business builders build their companies. And I would argue you can't do it unless you have the right people. Okay. So you're the one who started it. So you said you made every mistake in the book. Talk a little bit about some of the ones that are top of mind for you that you see other folks making as well. Sure. A very common mistake is that you don't know what you're looking for. So I don't care if you're hiring a chief financial officer or a product manager or a sales rep in Toledo, they're not all the same. And unless you've really stopped to think about and write down what is that person gonna be doing every day? What is the charter of this role? How will I define success 12 months from now? When I look back, 
how do I know if the person was even successful? So many people say, well, I'll, I'll know it when I see it, right? It's like porn. I'll, I'll, I'll know it when I see it. And so they interview 5, 10, 15 people, and then they just pick the best of the bunch. But I would argue in many cases, they're looking at the wrong bunch, right? Or they're looking at a random bunch, people that re reply to a job posting, uh, et cetera. So that's a very common one. And I used to make that mistake all the time, right? Hiring a warm body um, who was just the best of the bunch, but I was looking at the wrong people entirely. So that's kind of a sourcing issue. Um, I hired a gal who on paper was amazing, went to Harvard Business School for a head of marketing position. Uh, you would think she was God's gift to marketing. The interview was great. My investors loved her. Uh, but as I came to find out, she was a very good cerebral theoretical thinker, but when it came to getting shit done, she was much more of an analysis paralysis type. She, she couldn't you know, get, get stuff done. And I see you nodding. It happens all the time, right? So it turns out education is not predictive of success. Industry experience is not predictive of success. GPA is not predictive of success. Even interviews are not highly predictive of success. So I've learned one trick along the way that we can talk about that has helped a lot. So I've made all these mistakes. My clients make the same mistakes and that's what I'm on a bit of a mission to, to help people with. So you said that one of the mistakes you made that a lot of people make is you don't know what you're looking for. Um, are you talking about you don't know the skill sets you're looking for or because I heard you say something like, yeah, we, and we all have this, right? Sure. We hire sure. on sort of what looks good on paper or likability or like our or gut feel or work. gut feel gut feel. Right. So it, 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 we all know that. And what you're saying is that doesn't work. So there's two main buckets when you're defining what it is that you're looking for. The first are competencies. So let's use the example of I'm hiring my first sales rep, right? I've got a five person company, little website design firm, things are going great. It's time to hire our first sales rep. Unless I've really stopped to think about what success looks like, what do I expect this person to do every day? How will I measure success? How will I hold, hold them accountable? Am I hiring a hunter or a farmer? Now, their titles might be exactly the same. Their resumes look very similar in many cases. A hunter, of course, being the person that goes out and brings in the business and, and, a, and a farmer being more of a account manager, client relationship owner, right? They both have the same title, perhaps the same compensation. But if I'm looking for a hunter and I hire a farmer, they will fail very, very quickly. And vice versa, by the way, because it's a to it turns out it's a totally different set of competencies, right? Neither one's right or wrong, better or worse. They're just different, right? Um, so you really need to stop to think about what are the competencies? What will this person be doing every day to define success? The second bucket is what I call DNA. Now, a lot of people call this culture fit. I've been doing this 25 years. I don't know how to interview someone for culture fit, but I do know how to interview them for their DNA. And DNA, and I've got a whole chapter in the book about this because it's highly predictive. If I know how you are hardwired, much like I know your physical DNA, you know, your height, your hair color, all that type of stuff. Emotional personality DNA is hardwired, so psychologists tell us, by age eight. So if I know you're highly, high attention to detail, very creative, multitasker, you know, what is your wiring? That doesn't change usually, and it's highly predictive of success if I match it to the right role. So again, most people just start interviewing. Get me a bunch of resumes and I'll start interviewing. They don't think about the competencies, they don't think about the DNA, and the sad fact is that our, the hiring accuracy in this country is about 50%. So 18 months is the average that an employee lasts, although you usually know after 18 days or weeks, right? Um, and the average person is not a, is not a fit. And so I'm on this mission to help people recruit a lot more effectively, a lot more predictively. Okay. I got it. I got it. You know, I was taking notes. Um, and I really like that because I have noticed myself, I've held a few marketing roles. And one of the things that became really, really clear to me, just like you said, there's hunters and there's farmers in the sure. world of marketing. 
there are people who build systems and yeah. create things versus people who maximize what you have optimizers. Right. Right. Yep. I, I am not a good optimizer. Well, it's a very different skill set. Again, it's not good or bad. You know, in VPs of marketing, which I do a lot of searches for, I find there are VPs of mar heads of marketing that are very creative. They're not quite as strong on the analytics, but they're just amazing creative thinkers. And so you want to pair them with an analytical person, a numbers person, whatever. Then there are amazing analytical marketers who frankly aren't that creative, right? And so you're better to pair them with an ad agency, a design firm, whatever, because marketing of course takes both halves. And so you'll find many roles, even CFO, head of technology, web developer, where the title doesn't tell you much. Even the job spec doesn't tell you much. You really have to get to the core of that person. Okay, so I'm gonna like diverge here ever so briefly, but I am, crazy about job descriptions. They are such a peeve of mine. Yeah, me too. Because in my world, my the I would like to see job descriptions that highlight what I call success behaviors. Maybe that's what speaks to your competency. Tell me what you mean by success behavior. So let's let's pick on the poor salespeople. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we salespeople, right? Everybody else does, right? Right, why not? Uh, like a success behavior for salespeople, I believe, is that, you, let's say, for example, you need to have so many, fate, like if you know what your business is like and what it takes to sell a product, which small business owners need to know before they hire salespeople, yep. Yep. Um, let's say you know that to be successful, you have to have so many face-to-face -face meetings, those need, those need to be followed by so many phone calls, need you know to be followed. You know what your funnel looks like. You've identified you know what your funnel looks like, and, and, and I'm talking about a behavior, not will sell $20 million worth of product. But what does it take to sell $20 million worth of product? Right. Right? It yep. takes these behaviors. Correct. Most job descriptions completely miss that. In fact, if you look at most job descriptions, I'd say 95, 99%. Go to any job board, look at job descriptions. First of all, they're boring. Right. They're not inspiring. They're not engaging or emotional in any way. They've been written... It, almost like by a lawyer or some HR person, nothing wrong with those types, but it should be a marketing or advertising document because the reality that we're living in is we're at 4.1% unemployment. For knowledge workers, it's 2%. So we're at full employment, right? Full employment, hyper employment. If you're going to use job descriptions to engage people to, who are currently working to look at your opportunity, that job spec should be a masterfully written piece of prose that almost brings them to tears. It's so engaging. It's so exciting. Instead, what you find is a bullet-pointed list of requirements. Must have five to ten years experience of this. Must know eight years of Java and that. Blah, 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 blah. Now, by the way, those things are usually not predictive of anything. Every study has shown. But here's the sad fact, Ivana. Harvard Business Review did an amazing study about four years ago, and they found that most job seekers, most individuals, if they don't feel they match those criteria, they won't even apply for the job. For women, it's almost 100%. They take them very literally, and I think part of it is because who wants to be rejected, right? Who wants to waste their time and emotionally be vulnerable and stuff to be rejected? So if I read the five bullet points and I'm like, well, I only hit two of them, I'm not going to apply, right? I, I, you know, Jeff, from time to time, I will go in and look at, um, you know, what folks are looking for in terms of marketing folks, right? Just so I, just so I can see what's out there. And I've come to the conclusion a couple of years ago, just by purely reading job descriptions that I'm completely and completely and totally unemployable by a corporation based on It would on make you think that, but the truth is you're, you're a rock star. You're not unemployable. The problem is the company has not seen it through your eyes, right? Companies, smart companies are starting to involve their marketing department in their recruiting because recruiting is nothing but marketing and sales. You've got a funnel. My whole book talks about this. It's marketing and sales now, right? And so if you're going to win the war for talent, I have to find words, pros that engage people who aren't looking. In fact, what I really should be doing is video because video tells a story. It makes an emotional connection. 
And if your job descriptions that you're posting don't have a link to a YouTube video that shows some of your happy, shiny people, that explains what your mission of your company is, that profiles your amazing CEO who's dynamic, that can't come through in a bunch of words on a job spec. Wait, this is going to about to the next question. I know I strayed from what I shared with you, but this is going to my next question. You use a lot of sports analogies, right? So you said when the NFL and the, you know, we just said it was a Steeler fan, so <laughs> right. And what what? I'm a, a Packers fan living in Chicago. Yeah, right. So, but so you're a Packers fan. That's Seven. awesome because that's like my other favorite team, right? Yeah, there you uh, go. One of the things that's really astonishing to me about. Um, the draft, which you mentioned, yeah. what's funny to, and I, have, I am not a sports expert by any stretch, but yeah. in my own little girl brain, I'm thinking to myself, oh, because I live in Cleveland, home of the Browns, who suck. And I'm like, they so the suck. Browns are going to get- They have growth opportunities. They have growth opportunities. So they get the first round draft pick. They get to draft the quote unquote best player who ends up failing inside this organization, yeah. they go to another team and go to the Super Bowl. So I'm like, clearly this first round draft picking rock star thing. In fact, there, there has been this whole conversation, I think that's what you mentioned in your book, that, um, or I read something that you said, um, that there are, uh, what do you call them, the recruits, the players that are about to be drafted, that are like, oh dear Lord, don't pick me first. So can you imagine the pressure of being picked first? That much money, everything riding on it. And here's the reality to your, to your question. And I'm no sports expert either, but it's not that far from business, right? One person cannot make a company. One person cannot define a team. Michael Jordan's team, the Bulls, did better when his average scoring was lower and the rest of the team was all performing at a high performance level. The Bulls won and were unstoppable with the three-peats when his scoring was not optimized. So you need to optimize the team, not optimize for a given individual. So that's, that's issue number one. Issue num number two is, just as in the draft, in sports drafts, it's very difficult in business to predict success. Like I said earlier, an interview, which is the number one way most people try to predict success, is highly unpredictive. Sitting in a white room, across from each other, using theoretical, hypothetical questions, bears very little resemblance to how that person is gonna actually do in the real world, which is why we use the test drive with every candidate before we hire them. But that's totally different, it's a simulation, very different than an interview. So it is very hard to predict in general, but relying on one person to make your team, and it's also dangerous. What happens if that one person leaves? You know, the killer that's making half your number, you have five sales reps, that one leaves, because he or she, their phones ring off the hook from headhunters, and your four are left to make the number. It's very, very dangerous. You need a team of rock stars versus one. You are my straight man. You're my sidekick. <laughs> okay, so let's get to the nitty gritty, which I was telling you, I was not gonna blow my wad on this whole thing, because I am fascinated by what you say about uh, recruiting rock stars, like you, everyone has to be a rock star. Well, yeah, not everyone's be, a rock star. Let me be star. clear. Everyone, I believe everyone is a rock star. And I don't mean that in a very cheesy way. It sounds very cheesy. There's a lid for every pot, just like in dating. Everyone can find a home where they can do amazing work. Mm. Right. But if you're not in the right role or you're not in the right company, or, you're, or you have a crappy manager, which is half the problem in general, uh, then you're not gonna deliver rock star performance, right? So it's not that everyone should be a rock star. Everyone can be a rock star. But the issue is that when you are a hiring manager, CEO, running a small business, whatever, uh, it's very, very easy to hire a B or C player if you don't do it the right way. Oh, sneaky, sneaky. Mr. Marketing Guy. How did I sneak? Well, you sneaked. That was like, you know, um, you said, well, let me ask you the next question. You said that you could recognize a rock star. How do you recognize a rock star? How do well, you know I'm, you're in the presence of a rock star? I'm certainly Everyone's not. a rock star. I am absolutely not perfect. So I make plenty of hiring mistakes. 
when I do an executive search, I have a 12 month guarantee. So I tell my client, if I messed up and we hire someone and they're not a rock star, I have to replace them for 12 months. So I work really hard to make sure that we get an amazing person. But I believe anyone can, can get really good at this. It is not rocket science. I'm no rocket scientist, but you need a methodology. You need a process. And most people hire randomly. Like we discussed, they don't think about what they're looking for. They meet a bunch of people. They pick the best one in the bunch. They ask them a bunch of bullshit interview questions, and then they hire them. And then throw them into the pool with no onboarding and no training. So it's no surprise that, that a lot of people fail, right? So I wouldn't say that I'm so gifted at identifying rock stars. I would say that I'm very disciplined at having a process, which the book lays out. There's nothing secret about it. It's not some magic sauce. And by the way, it's simple, but not easy, right? There's nothing rocket science about it, but you have to be disciplined and you have to do it for every hire. And when you have that temptation to settle for a B player, you say no, and you keep looking, you keep that position vacant. And everyone around that role will pitch in and cover, which is far better than settling for a V player. As soon as you settle, you let the cancer in and it spreads like wildfire. But wait a minute, I'm sorry, wait a minute. Here's what I get. I love that you said there's a lid for every pot. I get it. And I remember when I was job hunting a million years ago, I, ha I had this awesome, I had this job and then they had layoffs and then, you know, last in, first out. Mm -hmm. And I remember a friend of mine saying, you know, even a, somewhere out there is a company saying, oh my God, what I would do for someone like this, right? Absolutely. It's just a question of finding that fit, right? Absolutely. Okay, so I get it. So you're saying everyone's a rock star. Everyone can belong somewhere. Everyone can excel in a role at a company. Now, by the way, job seekers own, own their piece of responsibility too. They don't do the due diligence. They don't ask the right questions. They settle. They take offers that are just the highest paying offer. So it takes two to tango, but this is not a job seeker program, right? And so the question is, how do I improve my odds, my hiring accuracy from that 50%, which is the standard in the US, which I don't think you'll ever get to 100%, but I do think you can get to 90%. You can get consistent enough that you have a 90% hiring accuracy. And what happens then when you have a team of rock stars and you make that 10% mistake and you let that C or B player in, it's like the body rejects the cell. They are out of there within a month or two because they, they know they're not going to be able to keep up. They don't want to be held accountable. And the others make it very clear to you that you've made a hiring mistake. Now, if you don't correct the hiring mistake, and exit that person, and you do it courteously, they're not a bad person, you made a mistake, you have to own it. But your rock stars will make it, make it very clear that you made a hiring mistake. Gotcha, so basically, rock stars equal good fit and a good hire, whereas B players and C players aren't people who are B players and C players, they're literally people that you maybe just hired to have a warm body, if I'm understanding right. you correctly. So, so to be specific, to be kind of more scientific about it, Yes, I agree with what you said, but when you make a mishire, a bad hire, you probably miss on one of three things. Either they don't have the will, so they don't want to do the job. There could be a lot of reasons for that, by the way. Um, they don't have the competencies to do the job, and you as the hiring manager or the company don't have the time to teach them those competencies. So there's a big difference between joining Deloitte where I might have a year long training program or joining a four person web design firm where you better hit the ground running on Thursday. Right. And then the third is just a DNA fit, which is where most people miss. The person is just not wired the way we're wired. We are all OCD attention to detail, anal retentive, and he's just a creative thinker and, and it's just not a, a, a love connection. Right. So usually I find when there's a mishire, it's on those, one of those three dimensions. Mm. Now, you know, you're just, you're just blowing my whole thing out of the water. In what way? Like, I was looking for the whole, remember the whole GE thing, like, you know, promote the top 10%, fire the bottom 10%. Oh, sure. Let's sure. Move on. What do you, I mean. Well, so the whole Jack Welch model, right? For those that don't know was 10% are your rock stars. Uh, I'm sorry, 20%. Right. 70% in the middle, they're your B players, and 10% you got to fire every year. 
you know, I've wrestled with that for a long time because I, I read his autobiography, Jack Welch, called Winning, and uh, I don't know that I buy it, right? I do buy that you need to continually top grade the team. Uh, I don't know that that means you have to fire 10% a year. There are some years there's no one to fire because everyone's just kicking ass, and there's other years where you realize I need to retool. Uh, I do think over time that balances out. But I, I think the piece I disagree with is that you need to settle for 20% of your team as A players and 70% are going to be B players. I don't know that I buy that. I do think you will inevitably have some people who are top performers, but I don't like that as an aspiration. I have clients who say, well, it's okay if I hire a killer and then surround them with a team of B players. I don't, that feels like settling to me. And if you're paying enough, and of course compensation ties to this whole discussion, especially in a competitive market like now, um, I just don't think you need to settle for B players. The C, the C players are easy, right? That's like you made a clear mistake and you get rid of them. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people wait too long on those two, but there's a huge difference between an A and a B. The studies show that the difference between an A player and a B player can be five to 10 times in productivity, in efficiency, in effectiveness. So you're not talking about a 10% difference. So would you, the question to ask is, would you rather have a team of five rock stars who you pay really well, or would you rather take that money and spread it like peanut butter and have 10 B players, right? I'd rather have the smaller team of rock stars. We were talking about this with, uh, I don't, are you familiar with the uh, platform BuzzSumo? Yes, of course. Right, BuzzSumo, right? BuzzSumo, and yeah. He, that's exactly what, he, what Steve did. Yeah. He found two people. That entire platform. Was built with two people. Was built with two people. Yep. And he paid them insane amounts of money. Yep. And, and it, it was amazing. I, I, he was at an event that I had and we were chatting about it. And I was just blown away by that story. Right. I mean, you, better, you better pick them damn well if you're <laughs> going to count on just a few people. But if you're paying enough, you'll have no shortage of people that are interested. But then again, you need to be methodical and disciplined and vet the hell out of them before saying you're my two, three, five people versus most companies who just, again, spread the money and they get five, 10, 20 people. So let's talk a little bit about the process that you go over in your book, right? Um, we know we want folks to get the book. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but kind of give us a cursory overview of the model that you use to hire okay. these rock stars. So what I did was, um, it, it's based on the course that I teach at Kellogg, right? Which is a business school in, in here in Chicago. And I identified the 10 key problems, or the 10 key mistakes that I see companies make time and time again. We've touched on a few already. Don't know what I'm looking for. Uh, hire for things that are not predictive of success. Write crappy job descriptions. A huge one, of course, is hiring managers who have no idea how to interview, what questions to even ask. That's a, that's a big one. And so I broke all these 10 down, uh, many of these mistakes I've made over time, and then I just focused on what, what should you do. And it turns out they're quite different in all 10 cases. Um, for example, most companies don't onboard employees at all, even rock star employees. I hire a great employee, and then I throw them in the pool on Monday and you know, show them the bathroom, fill out these forms, you're onboarded. And even rock stars need to be onboarded, even if it's only for a month or so. So if you take those 10 and compare them to these 10, 50% accuracy, 90% accuracy, that is a game changer for any company, right? Uh, and so that's, that's what the book kind of goes through. It's very much a practical how-to guide it's a, as opposed to just the strategy. Yeah, and I think the, the crux of that too is uh, and let's maybe talk about practicalities. I work with a lot of main street businesses. So we're not talking about huge companies where hiring an employee is a big deal. Sure. Because if you've got 10 people and you're hiring one, you're increasing your headcount by 10%. Exactly. You know, hundreds of thousands of employees hiring one person. Exactly. And so, and a lot of times when I work with small business owners, uh, let's say they obviously, if they're talking to me, they're struggling with sales. Yeah. right? They want more customers. So they, they're willing to make some kind of an investment to have more customers. But I could see by their conversation, and I am not a recruiter. I'm not like an expert in that area by any stretch. Yeah. 
but it definitely, you know, I do have a philosophy, which is as the business owner, it's up to, you don't have to do it well, but you got to give it the college try to give people a sales and marketing process that you've been through to get to this point. That is exactly correct. It's a huge is that issue. Correct? It's Maybe. a huge issue. Small to mid-sized companies think that I'm going to hire a bunch of salespeople. It's going to solve my problem. Right. So, and then they fail. Yeah, that's right. So taking a step back, biggest problem for small and mid-sized businesses, almost any business is revenue. I don't have enough revenue. I don't have enough customers, right? Because a lot, little revenue solves a lot of problems. So the answer is, I'm going to go hire a bunch of salespeople. And you're exactly right, Ivana, which is, if I don't know the sales process, if I haven't figured it out yet, and then I go hire a bunch of sales reps, they're going to fail too. Because the issue is not the sales reps. The issue is, we don't have a well-defined sales process. How do we engage with prospects? How do we convert them into trial? How do we move from brand awareness down to engagement, you know, the, the marketing funnel? Um, it's not about, you don't have a hiring problem. You have a business model problem that you need to crack first before throwing, uh, you know, fire, uh, gas on the fire. I agree. I mean, I didn't know if I was correct in that, but I, I'm very aware of, of this thing that you're talking about, which is you need to know, do you need someone that creates a sales process or do you need someone that's going to optimize that sales process? Correct. You know? Or just an executor. You know, there are amazing sales reps who... They put their head, their nose to the grindstone and they can execute every day. They want to be paid for it. That's great. God bless them. But if you ask them to retool your sales process or redesign your brochure or whatever, fi figure out a new sales channel, they are the wrong person. And you need to kind of know that. And so, um, I don't know if you've had experience with this. Sounds like you work with a lot of bigger companies, but you were, you had your own companies too. Oh, I, I, half my clients are very small, uh, you know, how do you help them? How do you help them? Like, let's say somebody, especially tech folks, right? You've got tech folks that are great at like designing code and, you know, whatever. They get, they get those customers, but they need more customers. Right. And they don't know how to sell and they don't have a process. Right. And like, what do you do there? So I actually, which may be kind of heresy for a recruiter, is I start with the assumption that it's not a recruiting problem. Because I've started a bunch of companies, I can sit in a discussion and really try to figure out what is their problem, right? I know 90% of problems are recruiting problems, but I need to understand, does the business model work? Are the right success uh, levers in place? How do we know our product is any good? Have we bothered to talk to a customer? Have, have we done a competitive analysis? Um, do customers like using the product? So a good example, this movie I see over and over, is my client will think it's a, it's a sales problem, right? We need to bring in more customers. I'm gonna hire more sales reps, more customers. They engage me to hire a VP of sales or whatever. When I look at the numbers, and it's very clear that they're losing all the customers at the bottom of the bathtub. Their customers hate the product. It's too expensive, so they're not seeing the value. Usability is a problem bugs, you know, whatever it may be. It doesn't even have to be a technology product. They just are losing as many customers as they're getting. So they don't have a cust customer sales problem. They have a product problem. And unless you fill the holes in the bottom of the bathtub first, look at his hiring salespeople. So do you think that given what you've said, that most problems that businesses have are Hiring problems, people problems, lack of rock star problems, lack of a good fit problem. How do you help a small business owner staff for success if they don't have a lot, you know, because that's like the right, not chicken and the egg or like yeah. whatever, right? Sure. Like I don't have enough money, but I need, I need customers to get money or I need yeah, sure, sure. How sure. does that work? So, you know, I subscribe to someone that's taught me a great deal, which is the e-myth, right? And the e-myth mastery, which I'm sure a lot of your viewers have read. Are you going to work in the business or are you going to work on the business? That is a fundamental mindset, fundamental mindset change that you need to make. Am I going to be the sales rep or do I want to design a sales process where I can scale this and hire five or 10 or 20 salespeople? There's nothing wrong with either way. If you want to be an independent practitioner, you don't want to work for the man, you don't want to have to babysit people, you want to have full freedom to travel and just be a web designer or whatever, 
or make cupcakes, God bless you. But if you want to scale a business, as you read in that book, and if you haven't read that book, you have to, Eve Myth. Um, what Michael talks about is that you need to focus on scaling the process. You're not making the cupcakes. You're not designing the websites. You're not selling the customers. You're responsible for figuring out the business model, the formulas, the processes, the systems, and then hiring people. And if you do that, I know it takes a leap of faith, but the money takes care of itself because the business starts to become successful. You start to have customers, you start to have revenue, you can't afford to pay people. So that's, that's the first decision that a lot of entrepreneurs fail on. Well, they made the decision, here's what I see, yeah. on the court, literally. I want to work on my business, but they can't extricate themselves. They can't let go. They, it's not even that letting go, it's almost, it's a very, very practical problem, right? Here's how I, this is my, the way I describe it. They wake up every morning, they have their little coffee, and they, uh, they sit in their little aspirational world. They read the Wall Street Journal, they might read some entrepreneur book, maybe they go to, they act as if they're working on their business. Yeah. And then the phone rings, and then they freak out. Yep. And then they go take care of business. And yep. this happens, so it's almost like, you know, they can't, they can decide in their head, but they can't actually take action to get there. Right, so if you're not good at that, whether you can acknowledge it or not, it's okay to get help. It could be a business coach, a spouse, a friend, a partner, or your co-founder, someone who is good at breaking down the big picture into actionable steps, prioritizing them, coming up with a sequence. What matters first? What are we not going to do? Deciding what we're not going to do is as important as what we're going to do. And I don't want to turn this into a big discussion on starting a company, but a lot of entrepreneurs are not great at that. But that is what's required to build a company. So if your goal is to build a company and you suck at it, back to recruiting, you better find someone who complements you with those skills. And if you can't afford to pay a full-time person, find that help somewhere. It could be an advisor, a coach, give them equity. Maybe your husband or wife is great at that, whatever, right? But it is about breaking down, what am I going to focus on today? What has to get done? So let's talk a little bit about virtual teams, Right, because yeah. as I mentioned in the introduction, you know, some like truly like ninety percent of all the small business owners out there have no employees. Correct. You know, yeah. I have no employees, but I have a team. Correct. Yep. So, what have you seen in the world of virtual teams? How virtual teams work, and how does hiring rock stars work inside of that realm? Uh, I think a lot of it applies. Most of it. Because whether I'm hiring you for a full-time job, which by the way, on average these days is 18 months, or I'm hiring you for a project or a gig or whatever it is you want to call it, short-term assignment, I still need to make sure that you have the competencies, the desire to do it, et cetera. I do think it's okay to compromise on fit a little bit, right? Because the person's probably not going to be staying around that long. But even then, if you don't speak the same language, and by that I mean share the same view of the world right? Expectations about attention to detail. If I hire a, a writer who's an amazing writer, but has really crappy attention to detail, so I have to spend all my time proofreading it and editing it, then why bother, right? That, that kind of defeats the purpose. So you really need to think about, even with a project person, what are those competencies? What is that DNA? But in a virtual team, if you're a crappy manager of a regular team, you're going to be a crappy manager of a virtual team, especially if they're not even physically co-located, which I'm looking at your video and I'm assuming it's not, they're remote. So it's even more incumbent on you to set uh, you know, priorities, hold them accountable, metrics, how am I gonna measure you, including some piece of the compensation on a pay per performance basis, may not be all of it, but enough that the person cares about some key metric. Um, but I'd say most of it applies to to a virtual team, especially if they're not co-located in one space. You have to be an even better manager to manage that, that, that structure. Yeah, this whole thing is so fascinating to me because it really does, as usual, you know, land on the back of the business owner. But what it takes, and I don't know, and a lot of folks have gotten themselves to a point, at least based on what I've seen, 
where their, uh, what do they call it, back up is, their back is against the wall or, you know, things are happening. But um, I think what's key about what you're saying, to go back to the e-myth, which I love, and one of my favorite exercises in that book is uh, and a recommendation, recommendation that I give, but I want to hear your take yeah. on this thing, yeah. which is to sit down and write down all the tasks that have to happen, right back to your process, yeah. all the tasks that have to happen, and then identify the ones that only you can do. Correct. Only, and you have to be very disciplined about that, right? Clear. I do that with exercise with, with clients sometimes. And the, I, I'm like, why do you have to do that? In fact, I could find you someone better than you. Why are you writing this job description? Let's get a copywriter for 50 bucks. They'll write an amazing job description. Why are you spending your time writing this? Right? And they're like, oh, I, I don't know. I assumed I had to do it. Right. So, so there is that thing that only you can do, right? Sure. I've, that, that transformed everything yeah. for me. Your, your one thing. What is your one thing? In my business and recruiting, I'm really good at assessing and vetting candidates. I have a team, a virtual team that helps me find candidates for a specific role. But when it comes to interviewing and vetting them, I, I wouldn't delegate that. That's, I can't outsource that. That's my one thing, right? But you as the entrepreneur, as the business leader or department head, if you're at a bigger company, to understand what is your one thing. In addition to, of course, leading people, which is always one thing that you need to do. Correct. So having said that, as you, so now you have this list of items that you're going to help people, that you're going to get, delegate to other people. Yep. Right. Inside of that list, now you've got to find that rock star, which as we've defined, is someone that's got this very specific set of capabilities. And you've yep. got to somehow, and I would love to hear your advice to small business owners about how to think about certain things. For example, I have a client whose key part of the business is networking, yep. meeting people, right? Yep. Now, what he does is he will go through his LinkedIn profile and like find these people. And I'm like, now, you know, you can delegate that, give folks some, some criteria yep, yep. and have them vet those folks. And then, sure. so that you, you know, but you are the only person who can be the face. Absolutely. Right. Some companies, some companies, that's the model and other companies, you don't need to be the face, but you need to understand for your model, what role do you need to play? So how do you get them? So how do you get folks to really stop and think about, like look inside themselves? Now, I remember how hard this was to do. I, I can do it pretty well now, but it was practice yeah. to say, this is kind when I do this, this is what I'm looking for. Yeah. Or, you know, these are the, like when you are um, vetting folks and when you're diagnosing or making that connection, it's kind of an intuitive process. Yes, only you can do it. Yeah. But you have had to like probably... If you had to give it to someone else, I'm thinking you can kind of break down what you're looking for, that right. stuff that goes on in the back of your head. Talk about that. How do you I get to that? I think there's two things. The first is if it's a process where I could document it, like I could literally write out step one, do this, step two, do this. If I can do that, then it's quite possible that I can delegate it. In fact, you shouldn't delegate it until you have that process mapped out, right? If I was writing out and I got stuck and I said, I don't even know how to document this because it's just so visceral for me, that may be a good indication that that's your one thing, right? Because I, I don't even know how I would explain to you. I, I think for some cooks, it probably works that way for some artists, but many jobs are not about those things. They're about something that can be delegated, that can be outsourced. The second question I would ask myself is, or ask my, that person, are you in the top 5% in the world? Because now you can access global talent on a moment's notice through all these websites, uh, you know, uh, candidate finding websites. And if you're not in the top 5%, you shouldn't be doing it, right? So when we look for candidates, we're looking for the top 5%. You know, averages, of course, top 50th percent. That's easy to find. Uh, you can usually even find 75th percentile. And for most entrepreneurs, they're about 75th percentile at a lot of things. But if I can find a 95th percentile person, the best writer, the best designer, the best editor, the best whatever, 
Now, as long as I can manage that team, if I'm a crappy manager, then I got a different issue. Either I better learn to become a manager, hire a full-time manager or a chief operating officer, or decide I'm not gonna try to scale this business because hiring is not gonna solve the problem. But if you're not in the top 5% and you can document the process, why are you doing it? That's awesome. How do you know if you're in the top 5% of anything? That's a great question. That's the hard part. That's the um, hard part, right? That's the hard part. I think if you're, if you're, if you have a reasonable EQ and you really are honest with yourself. So I think I'm a good writer. I'm not a top 5% writer. I've met top 5% writers. You know, you read their stuff and you weep. So that's, you know, that's an example. Um, you know, a good creative person. I'm a good creative person, but I met and people that just, they're gifted, right? So I, I guess I would be inclined to say if, a, if you don't think you're in the top 5%, you're probably not. That's probably true. What if, if you have an, what if you, modest. what if you have an issue and you're like, I'm not top 5% in anything, I suck. Then you need a therapist and not a recruiter. <laughs> <laughs> Or your mom didn't hug you enough as a child. <laughs> awesome. All right. So, Jeff, talk a little bit about the book and who should buy the book and where they can buy the book and what they can find in the book and why they should buy the book and all that kind of good stuff. Well, the book is for people that are serious about doing this. So if you're half-ass, you're not sure, you're wasting your time. I, I wouldn't buy the book. I don't want your money. I would say if you are ready to make that kind of commitment to dramatically upgrading the caliber of your team and the people that you let on that team, and you want to go from 50% to 90%, which is a game changer, I think, for most companies, then the book is for you. So that could be an entrepreneur, a CEO, uh, could be a department head. So let's say you're a head of sales or head of marketing and you, and you hire people. Uh, I've had investors buy the book, so they want to hold their uh, investments accountable to hire better people. Or if you, as we were discussing, Yvonne, if you would just hire project people, right, um, for projects, it's going to help you as well. So, so those are the types of people it's really written for. It's absolutely not a job-seeking book, a job searcher's book, how to write a resume. It's not. It's not that at all. Yeah, uh, yeah. Where to get it is Amazon, right? Find booksellers everywhere. And if it's not, if it's not called Amazon, then it's not a fine bookseller. So. <laughs> The, the cover looks just like this and recruit rock stars. And, you know, it's just, it's a 10 step playbook and it takes you through how to find winners, how to interview them, how to pick them, how to get the yes, because that's a big problem when you are looking at rock stars, right? B and C players don't have a lot of opportunities. You make them an offer. They usually say yes. Rock stars can name their ticket. So there is a way to getting the yes every time. And, and again, that's a, it's just following a process. So, one of the things I was kind of curious about is uh, if you have, if you're the owner of a company and it doesn't matter what kind of company it is, right? Whether you have an infrastructure and people sitting in offices or virtual or whatever these days. Sure. Um, I guess my question is what about folks who are just, I can't find good people. It's an excuse. Is that it's an good, excuse? What is that? If you're good people everywhere. Now, what if you're constantly like, if you're constantly looking for people, hiring people, people are leaving or you're firing. Well, then them. they're not the problem. You're the problem. You're hiring the wrong people. You're looking in the wrong places, or you're letting B and C players on the team. So then you have to replace them and find someone else because you settle for a warm body. But again, you are the problem. They are not the problem. And so. The, the, the biggest place you should be finding most of your hires hmm. is through networking. Now, that sounds obvious, but it is not what most people do. 50% of your hires should come from employee referrals if you have employees. Another 10 or 20% from your own network. So very, few, very little of your hiring should be random off-the-street hiring. You know, job postings from job boards, headhunters. I should be the last resort. Way too expensive. You should be doing your own networking. And, and you'd be shocked at who can introduce you to great talent. I've hired people through my mom. I've hired people through my lawyer, my dentist. You need to be very clear about your, what you're looking for. Don't give them a long laundry list. Say, I'm looking for the best sales rep in Columbus who's ever sold financial services. Who do you know? Oh, well, I know this person. This 
can you make an introduction? You get a warm introduction and you say, you know what, Bob said you're the best. I'd love to talk to you for just 10 minutes. And you engage them in a discussion. Does this take a little bit of time? Yes. Does it take a lot less time than managing and micromanaging and babysitting B players and C players? Oh my God, it's, it's a fraction of the time. Uh, but you most know, companies, you know, most of their people don't come through networking. Now, one of the things that's interesting to me, and I have to say this is sort of a peeve, Again, yep. one is the job descriptions. Yep. Two is that every time I've talked to headhunters, they're looking for very, very specific people. And what's interesting to me, I'm always looking for people, for example, I'm just going to give an example. My husband happens to be a scientist. He's got like, I don't know, 15 patents or something, right? Wow. And he happens to be- more than I have. Right? And he happens to be in the world of insulating foams. Yeah. Why don't just- However, what's really fascinating is the patents and the developments actually come when he is introduced to something new that he's never seen before. Yep. So in other words, if you had someone that was like just looking at the same, like, so the people who were like the Patels and the whatever R&D people, yep. they were stuck because this is what they look at all day long. Right. You want people that have a fresh perspective. Hiring rock stars from outside your industry is far better than hiring B and C players, what I call retreads, right? The, the people that your competitors spit out because they're B and C players. Now, there are certainly some industries where there is some really arcane specific knowledge, biotech or whatever, but in general, when my clients say to me, I want someone with 10 years of industry experience, and by the way, they usually, the industry hasn't existed for 10 years, I say, well, why? And they say, well, they'll ramp faster. Well, a, that's not true because it's been proven that industry experience, of course, it's a nice to have, but it's not highly predictive of success, right? Versus being a must have. Number two, what happens if they learned all these bad habits from your competitor? Who says your competitor knows what the hell they're doing, right? And if the person was really that good, how would your competitor let them get away in the first place? So hiring for industry experience, hiring for what school they went to, what their GPA was, hiring because they worked at Google or Apple or some fancy company, I'm just not predictive. But I'd love to talk to your husband. I have an opportunity that I might want to talk to him about. Awesome. We can do that. <laughs> that would but, be great. Okay. So we talked about, okay, so we talked about the book yep. and where you can find the book. Yep. And I'm going to lend this, end this interview with what I normally start the interview with. Yeah. Jeff, what do you know for sure? What do I know for sure? I know this was a lot of fun. Uh, what do I know for sure is that the best product, the best service, the best business idea doesn't have a chance without the right people to execute on that idea. And I don't care if it's two people, 200, 2000. Uh, we're living in a world now where if you launch an app, you have five competing apps within a week. So all barriers to, 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 to entry, all barriers to competition have been leveled. Having a rock star team that is energized, focused, disciplined, you can outcompete even the big guys. But without that, you don't have a chance. And I, I know that, I, I strongly believe that. I've seen it in it, so many industries, so many cities. And it's sad because a lot of entrepreneurs and inventors think you, the world will be the path to their door because they have a good product that's not enough. Well, there you have it. My God, learned so much about hiring rock stars. Let 2018 be the year where you hire your rock stars. And one thing that made me happy is that there's a lid for every pot. There you go. You're a hidden rock star. Get out there and find your perfect match. Jeff Hyman, thank you so much for being with us today. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me.